capabilities in knowledge management and information technology. So these are just a few examples uh, with which I wanted to show you that a country which is uh, and has very reluctantly over the past because of its specificity and its position in Europe has reluctantly engaged in European and global affairs, nevertheless uh, has made a sober analysis uh, at the beginning of the 1990s and achieved to generate political momentum for more engagement and engagement on a, on a global level. And we have put through the political innovation we uh, have engaged, I think we have put ourselves in a much better position. All this, and this doesn't come as a surprise uh, uh, to you, uh, you can never change or innovate or uh, put new accents in foreign policy without resistance, either back home or with other countries. It doesn't go without conflict, and this has been a learning process for the Swiss. Uh, they like to be liked. Uh, and they discovered that if you start to make proposals and if you start to take initiatives, uh, you might step on somebody's toes. And uh, this somebody might be powerful and then you have to struggle politically. So the whole concept of staying away from problems and the best strategy being just locking your door back home and and uh, going to sleep uh, would not really work. And I think we have discovered and learned that it doesn't work, that you have to engage, and if you engage, you will encounter problems and you have fight through the problems. What did we learn at the UN? I think that it, there is one capacity and one ability uh, I'm quite fond of to be a Swiss and where I have learned directly from my Swiss political experience in coming to the UN. Everything uh, in Switzerland is about getting majorities uh, in votes. And everything about the UN is getting a majority. And so the key feature I learned in my political career is uh, trying to build majority. And not majority because uh, we are Europeans and then sit together only with Europeans and uh, try to, to overpower others. I think we have learned that at the United Nations you need a, another kind of majority. You have to reach out to the like-minded wherever they are in the world. And we have all our projects and initiatives we have launched over the past years. We have launched them with colleagues from the five continents. Uh, I don't think that we had any success uh, without reaching out to, to all the continents, look where we can compromise, look where we can find common platforms, build coalitions of like-minded countries and then try to push uh, the issues. This is exactly, as I said, as making politics at the global level. I have been responsible in the community I grew up uh, for four years I was in local government and I said there is no difference at all whether you pass a local government budget or whether you pass a UN budget. You just have to have a majority at the end of the day and uh, the political mechanisms are the same. Controversy of course uh, has happened also back home. Some people do not think that what I am doing here is still neutral. Uh, that's facts of life. So we have a debate on what kind of engagements is permissible and doable and what is good and bad and what is still neutral and independent and impartial and what is not. Where would we align ourselves too much with the ones or the others? So we do have a lively debate uh, back home on what neutrality is and in concrete terms and how it plays out in our foreign policy. We do have a debate at the present moment on uh, our engagement in mediation efforts in different conflicts of the world. Uh, we do talk to Hamas and Hezbollah and, uh, and to, to the Iranian government and to the North Korean government and the government of Myanmar and, and many other governments do not talk to those governments because they consider those groups and governments as terrorist governments. 
uh, I have never represented a country which can allow himself the luxury of declaring somebody a and outlawing somebody as a terrorist and not trying to accommodate and to talk uh, with what the realities are. So we do talk uh, to those governments, but at the same time, this is not without problems. And we know that this is not without problems. You can't uncritically uh, talk to, to anybody. So you have to have a, a fine navigation in, in finding a good way of dialogue and at the same time uh, uh, keeping your care. So these are some... Uh, of the issues which uh, uh, today are debated uh, back home uh, in the international fora. And I would, uh, looking at the clock, say this is the, the moment where, uh, uh, although I would have a couple of uh, things more to say, well, I would very much like to give you the floor and the opportunity to uh, ask questions to me, either on what I said or what I didn't say. Thanks a lot. is very eager to hear your questions and uh, intelligent student questions first. Let's go. Back there, yes. Um, if the Swiss government were suddenly superimposed instead of the American government, do you think it would be able to function in the same manner with our population and resources? No, I think uh, a, a lot indeed has to do with size. You can't manage, uh, I've always thought uh, you, you can't manage uh, a country the same way whether it ha has 7.5 million or, 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 or almost 300 million. Uh, you, you may rem remember from, or somebody may remember from history studies, uh, w during the constitutional process in the United States, uh, Madison was sent to Europe uh, to look at, uh, at some European models and he came to Switzerland. And uh, he made a, an interesting report on direct democracy and whether it would work in the United States and in the size and the significance of the country. And he came to the conclusion that it wouldn't work and I, I would agree with him. Uh, uh, quantity sometimes uh, transforms into quality. You can't run uh, the same country uh, with such differences in size and positions. Mm, yes, I want to ask about the Swiss view of agricultural subsidies because I went to Switzerland in 1970 and I saw many successful small farms which were very beautiful. And I'm wondering, I know the European Union is heavily into subsidies, and what is Switzerland's attitude? Yeah, we are even worse. <laughs> <laughs> Switzerland is, uh, is indeed, uh, except I think for Japan, uh, the industrial country with, uh, w with the highest uh, portions of subsidies. And uh, this, uh, uh, I mean, uh, this is not to be quoted uh, in in, in the press, but I mean, it doesn't make sense uh, economically. It's, uh, it's heavily damageable. Uh, the, the reason why this system has been able to maintain throughout the years is, uh, is purely political. It's uh, a group of uh, people which have, import, uh, have political importance. Huh? The farmers' lobby is much bigger than the share of the farmers' population in Switzerland is. And because of the fact that we have many uh, cantons for which you need majorities in federal votes, and in many countries, agricultural communities uh, have, a, ha have a big say, uh, was one of the reasons why it was able to have uh, for so long time, so much subsidies. I think the general recognition today is that uh, we have to get rid of the subsidies for several reasons, because it doesn't make sense economically. It's harmful for developing countries because it uh, uh, inhibits their ability to, uh, to come to, to, to European and Swiss markets. So I suspect that uh, we will see 
uh, further 